Hello, I am Shaggy Philolitea. I don't introduce myself very often anymore. And I'm going to read for you something that I wrote when I was still just Vincent. Before I really, really understood myself as anything other than a producer of written material. This is something I wrote maybe three years ago, maybe four years ago. I titled it Laughing Buddha. I find myself routinely positioning myself as a sort of laughing Buddha in public. That is problematic, in large part because Western civilization, broadly the West, doesn't have a working co-definition of comedy, of laughter itself. We could dive into how Germany and England and France and Spain all broadly have wildly different definitions of what classifies as funny, and how even in these nations, the various countries have vast differences among the classes and professions and pretensions as to what is allowed to be laughed at. We could, but I'm not writing a book extolling the virtues of laughter. I'm not writing a history of comedy. Those, those exist. I've read a few. What I want to talk about is who the Laughing Buddha was. As best I can parse it out from the title, I've read personally, uh, from the little I've read personally on the subject and my own conjecture from personal experience and mystical revelation. There's a general sense among women and girls, mostly, that laughter is fundamentally mean, that laughing at anything is an act of meanness. They don't term it unkindness, they term it mean. There's a difference, and the difference is monumental. Mean and kind actually mean roughly the same thing. Mean is the antique West German, i.e. Anglo, word for mind. Basically, if you need to know, and I would want to know, so and I would want to know, so I'm going to tell you, what happened is that France was already Catholicized by the fall of Rome in the West, and the Western Germans were not. So when French was developing as a language, it looked to Latin for words relating to the spirit and the mind and the soul, i.e. religion, and the Germans, i.e. the Angles and the Saxons, more the Angles, I'm thinking, but I'm still learning. Um, sorry, I'm on a PDF file on my Kindle, so this is going to be interesting. I'm still learning, too. Look to their West German Proto-Indo-European speaking ancestors. The word they found was one that sounds like mean. As in a word that sounds like meaned or mind or mind if you're being a dick and want to sound different, or if you learn to speak it by reading it, as would be the case of the Normo, Norman Frank invaders who codified the English we sort of speak today. Certainly, we speak a descendant, but we do not speak it well or with anything amounting to the clarity with which our ancestors wielded it. But because the German languages were also only spoken in the abstract by people specifically trained to think in the abstract, their words also have double and sometimes infinite meanings, depending on the level of abstraction at which you're speaking and thinking. It's important when you're working with German words, with Celtic words in general, and by that I mean Proto-Indo-European words which are not Greek and Latinized, to remember about the people who wrote them, because we have them, and we know them, and we misuse them because we've read them, not because we listen to them spoken well, that they understood two very important things about thinking in their languages. One, the abstraction is everything. The words lose meaning if you want to dance around levels of abstraction like a child playing on all the, uh, trying on all the costumes backstage of a theater. And two, levels of abstraction are planes of thought, each one taking time and effort to master before it can be co-communicated to any listener, most especially an uninitiated, i.e. uneducated, listener. That said, mean also means intention, meaning, meaning is basically what you intend, what you have in mind. The mean or the meaning is what you plan to indicate or convey when you use a particular term. That said, oh sorry, this word, mean, let's call it, bumps up on the, uh, bumps up on the Welsh moon, I think that's pronounced moon from my limited grasp of Welsh, enjoyment. And that's what I'm talking about. Welsh is also a Celtic language, like Western German, but unlike Saxon, unlike, say, Saxon, it isn't West German. It's even further West. Welsh's relatives are in northwestern France and Ireland and Scotland and parts of Spain. 
unless I'm way wrong about that. I just found a paper claiming the Welsh DNA is found in Native Americans, which would be interesting to me because there's a theory of how Eastern North America was settled in the way back, uh, that the, the theory of how Eastern North America was settled in the way back was by French hunters of otters. Evidently, the theory goes they used canoes to hop from glacial island to glacial island as they followed the otters west across the Atlantic, eventually becoming the people the Iroquois would find when they got there, or something. I'm not entirely sure. It seems plausible enough to be flat wrong. But this guy in his DNA study from 2007 is interesting enough to me that I'm telling you I found it right now. Deal. What I'm talking about is how mean, meaning, and meanness are deeply confused in the contemporary English language. I'm not talking about how that is intentional. Kind and kindness are a totally different thing from mean and meanness. Your kind is your class, your sort, your variety. It comes from the same root word as gene, to give birth, beget, gene. To act in kindness toward another person means to treat them the way you were taught to treat your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your contemporary neighbors. It means to treat someone like family. To be a kind, to be of a kind with someone, means to be from the same family as them. This is an ancient concept. It loses all meaning in the modern world because the family unit died in the 1970s. It was burned up in the 1980s. It was bulldozed in the 1990s. In the 2000s, they paved over it. Last decade, they built a parking lot on it. And today, we're trying to install Tesla charge stations on the spot where the family unit and family-oriented family values or family-oriented value systems once thrived. But when you live in a village of a thousand people or fewer, treating everyone with kindness obviously matters. Even in a city of 500,000, knowing who your family are and with whom you can share resources when your times are tough and to whom you can give your resources when you are in surplus matters. It has meaning. And I wrote this before being homeless and watching them go through about six tubs of ice cream today at the Christ Table kitchen where I get my meals. It matters what you do with your extras. So when these women say that laughter is meanness... What exactly do they mean to say? Because laughter is not meanness. Not if meanness means thoughtfulness. Not if it means intentionality. Laughter is a surprise response. It's a delight response. It is actually an enjoyment response. So laughter is meanness if you have a Welsh, uh, a Welsh worldview. If you believe that meanness is enjoyment, that to be mean is to find enjoyment, then yes, laughter is meanness. But those people who say laughter is meanness and mean unkindness, what does that mean? Do they mean schadenfreude? The German concept of taking pleasure at someone else's misfortune? Because that can't be right either. We laugh at one another's misfortune as much out of gratitude that the unfortunate thing didn't happen to us as we laugh out of a sort of trauma response, a biological exclamation in the face of the terror and death that awaits the victim of the misfortune. This is why I've also said that laughter is a terror response. It's the only way to defeat the terror of history, and it's, it's certainly the only response to despair that actually combats the, the desperation. Certainly those people who say that laughter is meanness are correct when someone does or says something cruel with the intent of causing cruel laughter, but that laughter, cruel laughter, is an indicator of the hidden soul of the individual. What is cruel is not the laughter, but the delight the laughter represents. What is being taken to light in? Laughter and cruelty cannot be the same thing. They simply cannot. If they were, our ancestors would have had more words with which to indicate the intersection of these two ideas, and they simply don't exist. So that means that laughter as meanness and comedy as cruelty are modern ideas. And if only women and girls are saying them, that means they're feminist ideas. Feminism is the placard above the gateway to hell. La siate ogni speranza voi entrante. What did I mean when I said I find myself positioning myself as a sort of laughing Buddha? I meant just that. I find myself laughing at people who would position themselves as public figures, as public thinkers, as public speakers. I find myself in the position to react to them only by laughing. 
Anything else would go unnoticed or unheeded. Who was the Laughing Buddha, then? What is the Laughing Buddha? I'm sure you've seen it, the statuary and imagery of the fat Asiatic monk in his red robes with the drape over one shoulder sitting lotus style with his great big smile and beady little or even closed eyes. He's not Siddhartha. His name was Kichi, but I can't pronounce that, so I prefer his nickname, Budai. It means cloth sack, and it's appropriate. Budai Buddha was something of a Santa Claus figure. The legend about him is that as he proselytized clan uh, Chan Buddhism, that particular kind of Buddhism, which would become Zen in Japan, and spread to the West like COVID in the 1960s, he carried with him a cloth sack that he would fill with bits and baubles, knickknacks, trash, and everything in between. And, once the sack was full, he would gift all the junk he'd collected to the children of whatever city or village he was in. The why is yours to discover for yourself, I suppose. You are here to read about how I'm a laughing Buddha. But what you don't understand about the laughing Buddha is that he's not laughing with you. When he takes your trash, your baubles, your broken, uh, brokety, broken nickumnacks, he's not doing you a favor. He's not taking your garbage to the road for you, and he's most certainly not making a treasure out of it. He is not, then, laughing in kindness, you understand. He isn't simple. He isn't stupid. He most certainly isn't downsy. He's not laughing because the trials and the tribulations of this world are trivial. He isn't showing you that this junk has value to someone. He isn't showing children that even worthless baubles have worth if you look at them in the right way. Indeed, he is laughing at you. He is laughing at you. He's laughing because you think these things he's not doing are what he is doing. He's laughing because you're so wrong about everything. Everything you think, everything you believe, it's all wrong. But it's beneath him to open your eyes. Indeed, it is an act of violence for him to shine the light too brightly in your face. Liberals, socialists, and fascists, and communists, they call all language violence. Because in a way, language is a violation. Reading this even now, listening to me even now, if you are an intellective person, if you are a mindful and thoughtful and cognizant of your, and if you are mindful and thoughtful and cognizant of yourself as well as your environment, as well as of the fact that I wrote this and you did not, you are cognizant of the fact that reading, listening, is very nearly indistinguishable from thought. A stupid person, a useful idiot, say, does not know that what they have read is not what they have thought. An ordinary person does not know the difference. It's not my place to disclose to you the secrets of Buddhism, the mysteries of Chan or Zen, any more than it is my place or my responsibility to disclose to you the mysteries of your own mind. But I'll go. Uh, but I'm going to. There is no secret. The sound of one hand clapping is a slap in the face. You are less than you believe you are. You are what is funny. You are what is folly. It's especially, it is specifically that you are a fool and that you are foolish and that I am and once was myself that is funny to a laughing Buddha. But that's not cruelty. In no way is it cruelty. Laughing at you because you say things that are antithetical to, to your beliefs, laughing when I find myself sinning against myself, in fact, laughing at things which remind me of my and this world's traumas, these are not cruelty. These are not an act of meanness, of unkindness. Laughter, true, pure laughter, is an expression of true joy, is an act of love. In fact, it's the most loving act. It's an act of loving mercy. I could scorn your stupidity as my, my parents scorned me. I know scorn. Scorn is my first response. I know ridicule. Ridicule is my second response. I know cruelty. I know cruel, hateful laughter. I have been laughed at and ridiculed. Hurt by my family of all people. There's a story that I should never tell anyone, and I knew I should never tell the woman I most recently lived with and had bonded myself to romantically. And I'll, I'll come back 
I'll come back to this because you you want to hear this. I want to tell this story. I shouldn't have told her this. I shouldn't have told her anything embarrassing that I'd ever done because I knew what she was going to do. She was going to laugh and cruel to hurt me. Not like, oh, that was a silly thing you did, but you grew out of it. And, you know, that was, you learned and we move on and never bring it up. No, it was any mistake I ever made. It was, it was one, it was this story or, was it, or another story just to humiliate me. Women are bad about that. And so I understand why women think that laughter is cruelty. Women are cruel and they laugh at one another and they, they laugh that ha! <laughs> laugh they do when you say something that's true about them. And so they just laugh and scorn. Fuck that. I hate that. I could slap that behavior because when my sisters pulled that, they got slapped. You used to get slapped for that. Anyway, when I, I was a boy, nine, I couldn't have been in my, no, I don't even know how old I was. I was a boy, just a boy. And I and my maternal grandparents and probably even my, the youngest of my mother's sisters who would have been in high school and then her sister's children, the eldest was in high school and then the boy was a year older than me. And then my mother and my father and my brother, and then if my sisters were alive, they would have been real little. We were on a pontoon on a, on a lake, and I was sitting on the back of the pontoon on the, the little gate that opens up to, to go out the back to where the, the motors are. And I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. I was just sitting on the thing, and we weren't going anywhere. And then my granddad just gets it, gets the, the wild burr up his ass to gun it. And so I fall off the back. And I thought I'd fallen into the, the motors. I thought I'd fallen into the damn blades of this fucking thing. I thought I was going to be seriously injured. I didn't know there was a little platform there. And so I fell and I, I, what I now know is I had a little panic attack. I thought I was seriously injured and it turned out I was okay. And so I was a little embarrassed, but I got up and, and it wasn't, ha ha, that was a silly thing. And he pranked you and, oh, we sorry you were scared. No, they cruel, hurt filled. They wanted to hurt me laughter. It really fucked me up for the rest of my life. It really fucked me up for the rest of that vacation. That ruined that vacation for me. I, I could never trust any of them the same way again. I could never be vulnerable around them ever again. And that's what you don't understand about cruel laughter. That's what you don't understand about calling somebody cringe for, for getting on YouTube or TikTok or wherever they've gotten and trying to be themselves. The, the, cruel laughter, cruelty like that cuts in a way that makes people different but not in the changing my behavior to circumnavigate or understand negative feedback and then get positive feedback it kills you it's a death it's a dying and so i continue i know cruel hateful laughter i know what it is to be laughed at to be hurt by weaponized joy to see the face of someone you love cut you with their joy for cutting. I know narcissistic psychopathy and I laugh in its face. I laugh in yours, you who call me cringy. I laugh not because I am powerless, but because I am powerful. Laughter in the face of evil is the only defense our species has yet devised, which works. And it will always work. Evil is self-possessed. Evil is cruel and insecure. Evil laughs at cruelty. Evil assume or amuses itself with cruel acts. Evil is identified by its cruelty. To laugh in the face of an evil man or an evil woman is to unmask them is to announce their nudity and their shame for the whole world to see. Have you heard the story of the emperor's new clothes? What did everyone do? What did no one do? Laugh. No one laughed. Only the child even commented. But the child didn't laugh. Even when it turned out that he was a fool. Only the foolish and the cruel laughed. 
Today, our community is potentially billions of people will, uh, people wide. Thousands are the views that I've gotten this month. 9,000? Almost 9,000. Some of my videos, many of my videos right now, are sitting at about 400. And most of those are unique views. Billions of people. I look at, I look at like Rich Eisen, two hours after a video, and 5,000 people will click in. When I laugh at you, know that you should feel scorned. You should feel stupid. Dunning-Kruger doesn't just prove, but insists that you are, that I am, that we all are. None of us is so great we can see the whole of the landscape until we've taken the time to climb the mountain. There is no escalator. There is no elevator, no ski lift. It's a long and arduous climb to the top. How does it look from down there? You sure look funny to me.